there, there does seem to be an, in, an inherent sort of moral indignation at the use of biological weapons. And this is codified in law in the United Nations Biological Weapons Convention, which states that the use of biological weapons would be repugnant to the conscience of mankind. Um, and so it does kind of um, have this um, yuck factor almost, if you like, um, in it that makes it so different from other weapons, fr from a gun wound or a, a bomb or a landmine or something like that. Now today, um, the United States doesn't have an offensive biological weapons program. It does have a defensive biological weapons program. And that has been expanded greatly since September 11th. What we've seen in the United States is a, a huge expansion in the civilian biodefense effort, as well as in the military biodefense effort. And one solid estimate is that there's about $50 billion that have gone into biodefense research since September 11th. S certainly by nurturing a culture of fear, um, there is a way of, for, the, for the government to justify is, its role. And of course, a, a big role is played by the security industry, um, to some extent the pharmaceutical industry and the biotechnology industry, who sees the funding going into biodefense as a way for them to tie over uh, some of their funding gaps, for example, um, as a way to, of, of developing their company. They, ha they have a large lobby in Washington, so there's an interest there in hyping the threat. Well, it's certainly prudent to take precautionary measures against the threat of bioterrorism, but um, there are limits to the amount of resources and the amount of focus that should be devoted to these high consequence but low, very low probability events. Depending on how you portray the threat and the consequences of that threat, you have different ways of, of, of I guess, investing your resources. That's what, and that's one of the problems really with, with the uh, scenarios that are um, given for a potential bioterrorism attack or the films uh, that you see out there or the, the books that you read about potential bioterrorism incident, it's, is that it portrays a bioterrorism incident as though there will be mass casualties um, and um, mass fatalities, so uh, in the thousands. And it's, it's more likely that it'll be a crude biological weapon that's used, so a crude pathogen um, that will be distributed might still cause a large number of casualties, but those numbers would be in the hundreds rather than in the thousands. Um, so it's a misdirection of the focus. And a lot of this comes um, because of the scenarios that are uh, put on the table as um, possibilities of what would happen. And these scenarios often misrepresent the technical difficulties in developing a biological weapon, for example. So the entire uh, process of weaponizing a pathogen is often um, skimmed over, if you like. Well, the sarin attacks in Tokyo was a chemical weapon attack. But what was interesting about the sarin attacks that were committed by the Aum Shinrikyo cult uh, was that they had also had tried to develop biological weapons. They tried to develop anthrax, um, but failed, despite having an awful lot of money dedicated to it. They had a lab, they had well-educated scientists working on the problem. They just couldn't get the biological weapons to work. And that kind of shows you how difficult it is. So in order to weaponize a pathogen, for example, you would need to first obtain the pathogen, um, it's not helpful to use just any biological organism. There are certain criteria that you'd want your pathogen to have. Um, high infectivity, high um, transmission between people, um, sturdy so that it could take the weather conditions, uh, those sorts of things. Um, you then need to scale up that pathogen, um, grow it up essentially in fermenters, and from there you would need to disseminate it 
um, the dissemination process is incredibly difficult. The government is trying to respond to what it sees as a risk by increasing the biodefense industry or complex, yet ironically what it might actually be doing is increasing that risk even more. It seems the perpetrator of the anthrax letters was from the biodefense establishment. He was a scientist working within the biodefense establishment, so not at all the sort of person that was initially portrayed as being the perpetrator. He, he would not be considered a terrorist today. That's not where the current focus of the bioterrorist threat is. So the, the current focus is, is not on the people who work in the military establishment. And there we're seeing the ironic situation that re the response to the anthrax letters was the development of this incredibly large biodefense complex where more and more people are working. There's about 15,000 American um, scientists who now have access to what are called select agent pathogens. These are the most dangerous pathogens. Um, we're seeing the number of laboratories involved in this um, rapidly expand. And the problem there is we're not quite sure how many laboratories we have. So, so the irony here is that as a response to the anthrax letters that were committed or perpetrated that were sent out by someone within the military establishment, we're seeing a huge expansion in the biodefense complex. And um, as a result of that, the risk of something like this happening again is much greater.